Hey everyone, Hujiwana from Space Dark here. Today I want to talk about memorable spacecraft in science fiction, focusing on one in particular. There are a lot of standout designs in sci-fi, like the Constitution class from the original series of Star Trek, whose design language of saucer, engineering and nacelles is so strong that anything using them is instantly recognisable as being from a Star Trek. Even the real-life space shuttle was iconic. The huge, bright orange external tank with the two SRBs and black and white orbiter strapped to the side of it was so odd and interesting looking that it outshone even the Apollo program's Saturn V. It had such a deep cultural impact that if I say the word space plane, you're probably thinking of something that is two-tone black and white like the shuttle. But for many people, myself included, their favourite ship is one that was only on screen for maybe two minutes out of a two-hour film. If you cheated and looked at the thumbnail, you'll know what this is. The ISV Venture Star, the enormous cargo ship that goes between the solar system and Alpha Centauri in James Cameron's Avatar. It's one of the 12 ships built to carry people and materials to Pandora and bring back the highly prized but stupidly named Unobtainium to Earth. But why a gigantic corporate cargo ship and not Normandy or Yamato or Serenity or Resonante or Swordfish? Well for starters, and the most obvious thing about it, the two gigantic radiators, an often overlooked feature that spacecraft need to have. This is because out of the three ways to transfer heat, conduction, convection and radiation, only the last one works in vacuum and even then it is a slow process, so ships need to slowly radiate the heat away with large external panels. Without radiators, the waste heat from the crew, electronics, reactor and whatever other hot things a ship has will build up and cook everything. The shuttle had its radiators built into the cargo bay doors, which is why it's always had the bay open after reaching orbit. These white panels on the International Space Station aren't more solar panels. They are the radiators for the external active thermal control system, which collects waste heat using liquid coolant and moves it to the panels. For whatever reason, radiators are often left out of sci-fi designs. The Expanse, despite its many other realistic elements, doesn't include visible radiators, which is kind of a shame. The Discovery 1 from 2001 A Space Odyssey was originally supposed to have some on its engine section, but they weren't included due to fears the audience would mistake the big flat surfaces for wings. The fact that the Venture Star does include radiators makes it stand out, especially since they even glow. It's not shown, but the huge matter-antimatter engines built using using unobtainium from Pandora, one of the reasons the magic floaty rock is so important, were burning for nearly six months to decelerate the ship before its arrival, with a lot of that heat still slowly leaving the ship after it arrived. Another reason I love the design is its size. Now there are a lot of large ships in sci-fi, though they tend to be big just to be big rather than for any practical purpose, but for the Venture Star it's more that it's long rather than huge. There's plenty of other long craft in sci-fi, like the Hermes from The Martian, but that in particular seems to be a weird jumble of rearranged ISS parts with a centrifuge shoved into the middle of it and an engine section glued to the back. To its credit, it does have two kinds of radiators, but in my opinion it's still kind of an unimaginative NASA punk design, especially compared to the Hermes from the book. Older sci-fi did long spindly truss spaceships too, like the Valley Ford from Silent Running, which is just so cool looking with those six domes at the front of the massive red spine. Going back to 2001, the Discovery 1 was deliberately designed to be long as the crew section had to be kept far away from the nuclear reactors in the engine section. Radiation protection can be done with a massive shield, like a big lump of lead or huge tanks of water, but as any Kerbal Space Program player knows, the more mass you add onto your ship, the more engines you need to push it up, which needs more propellant, which needs more engines, which needs more propellant, and things just get worse from there. By putting the crew far from the radiation source means the Discovery 1 uses is the inverse square law, which sounds complicated but really just means that radiation exposure drops off rapidly over distance. The Venture Star does exactly the same thing, as the engines chuck out radiation while active, but unlike the Discovery, the Star takes it a step further. It tows the payload, passengers and crew far behind the engine section rather than pushing them ahead. This again goes back to mass. We know the crewed section needs to be kept far away, so why not build what would essentially be the Burj Khalifa on top of the engines? Well, the Burj Khalifa weighs about half a million tons in Earth's 1g of gravity. During the Venture Star's acceleration and deceleration phases, it hits 1.5g, so such a structure would be three quarters of a million tons. That needs more propellant. That needs more engines. Things get out of control. So instead of building a big, heavy, compressive structure on the top, the Venture Star just pulls the payload below it on a lightweight tensile structure. 
Those are the big reasons why it's cool, but there are so many little details that show how well thought out everything is. For example, while the passengers spend the entire six year subjective travel time in cryosleep, there were three crew teams that rotated through 20 month tours of watching over the ship. They need artificial gravity, thus the centrifuge which also folds down flat when under thrust. And by subjective time, I mean that's the length of time the ship experiences, as time dilation has to be taken into account. To an observer at Earth, the objective travel time to cross between the two stars is nearly seven years, just under a year longer than what the ship experiences. Some more neat features? The truss has shielding near the engine nozzles to protect it from the exhaust. It has two different types of fuel tank for the hydrogen and antimatter. There are robotic arms for loading and unloading the cargo section into the Valkyrie shuttles. Remember what I said about black and white space planes? The Valkyries also get left behind when the ISV returns to Earth, leaving more payload capacity for the precious unobtainium. There is also that huge mirror on the back of the ship. What's that for? Well, the craft can only carry so much propellant, which is used entirely on the Alpha Centauri side of the route. For leaving and arriving Earth and the solar system, the ship instead uses a 16 km diameter laser sail, which attaches to the connection point between the radiators at the very top of the spacecraft. That big mirror shield at the bottom of the ship protects it from being toasted by the laser, as well as detaching during the coast stage and moving in front of the ship to protect it from interstellar dust. All those features are why design constraints are important, whether they're realistic or not. For example, the Romulan de Deridex class has that huge negative space in the middle of it, because it was designed with the constraint that the warp nacelles had to see each other. The Battlestar Galactica was built during a time when networked computers were very vulnerable to Cylon hacking, which translates into a surprisingly low-tech but extremely characterful vessel. When constraints are ignored, you end up with things that can do everything and are boring because of it, or don't fit in with the setting or situation they are in, like with Voyager and its seemingly bottomless pit full of torpedoes and shuttlecraft. Constraints can also be applied too literally or without care, like that stupid mini warp nacelle that pops out of the top of the Prometheus class because every part of the multi-vector attack mode just has to be its own vessel. What happens after a battle when the middle part gets blown up? Can the top and bottom join together? Does Starfleet have spare middle sections just lying around? If they don't, do they just shove in an oversized McKee Raider in between and call it a day? If you might need three ships for a situation, just send three ships. Anyway, the Venture Star follows mostly real science for its constraints, so ends up being one of the more realistic spacecraft in sci-fi, where form almost entirely follows function. But that is exactly what makes it such an interesting design. Everything has a purpose, everything has thought and consideration behind it, and it still looks amazing. This is the core of why I love the ship so much, and I hope that maybe now you might too. Thanks for listening, this is Huji from Space Dock, signing off.